Hello, Alan. Uh, we've just Hello, finished Grant. another fine recording, um, and it's time to talk about one we did last week with uh, Kip Thorne, an old friend of yours. I love talking with Kip. I love talking with him every time we talk. He, first of all, he helped me when I was playing Richard Feynman, the great physicist on the stage in a play called QED. Really helped me understand some of quantum mechanics' more strange notions. And then, uh, often at night, uh, after the play, he'd join me up on stage and we'd talk to the audience about it. So he, he really likes bringing science, especially the more difficult aspects of science, to the public. The main thing that Kip talked about was uh, the detection of these two colliding black holes that sent out a gravitational wave and why that was so important and uh, how they detected it. And he sent me a link to uh, a video that was done by the uh, LIGO, the, the uh, instrument uh, team. And I'm going to put it up now. You'll see it's very nice. It shows the colliding black, black holes and how the gravity wave comes to Earth and how the LIGO was detected. Here it is. This is the sound of two black holes colliding and merging. Where did this sound come from? A long time ago, in the distant reaches of the universe, two black holes, each about 30 times as massive as our sun, were locked in orbit and spiraling in towards each other. The only visible traces of this spinning cataclysm would have been the way their gravitational fields warped the light of distant stars. Even as they collided and merged, there wasn't a flicker of light to be seen. The real and very violent action in the system was in the form of gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space and time. These waves were constantly draining energy from the black hole orbits, leading to their ultimate collision and merger to form a single black hole. At that instant, the power of the gravitational waves was 50 times greater than that of all the stars in the universe combined. That pulse of gravitational waves, lasting only a fraction of a second, expanded through the universe, passing unimpeded through countless galaxies. About 1.3 billion years later, it reached Earth. Gravitational waves alternately stretch and squeeze space itself and everything they pass through, but the effect is minuscule. Their effect on Earth here has been vastly exaggerated to help visualize something that is otherwise invisible on this scale. To detect them and directly measure their properties, scientists built LIGO, the most sensitive measuring device ever made. LIGO uses a device known as an interferometer to measure the tiny displacements in space. In this simplified representation, a laser beam is sent towards a partially reflecting mirror and split along two paths. The beams travel along the four kilometer arms and reflect back towards the central mirror, which recombines them, directing their light to a detector. As the gravitational waves pass, the distance between the central beam splitter and the end mirror stretches along one arm and compresses along the other. This changes the time it takes the light to travel along the arms. The recombined light waves shift with respect to one another and produce a signal at the detector. Incredibly tiny stretching and squeezing of space can actually be measured directly in this way. How little does space distort to make this signal? Let's zoom into a hydrogen atom until we reach the proton at its core. LIGO is so sensitive it can measure changes in distance as tiny as a thousandth the diameter of a proton. And this tiny measurement made by LIGO, was the final step in a journey that began 1.3 billion years ago in the distant universe when two black holes collided. So I actually went to see that facility when it was still being constructed. It was in the last stages of its being built. What did it look like? What, what, what did you see of it? Did you go underground? Not underground. The, the tubes are above ground. The, oh. the, yeah, the four kilometer, you know, two and a two and mile something tubes above ground. And there was a couple of fascinating things that they told me about when I was there. One was they had to make the tubes, um, they had to make them vacuums. It took them 40 days to pump out all the air, because this is the most amazing thing. You know, uh, Kip talks about the mirrors at the end of the tubes that actually are deflected or not by the uh, gravity wave. If there's a single air molecule 
molecule of oxygen hits the mirror, it'll move the mirror by more than the gravity wave would have done. Well, oh, so that's why they needed a vacuum. And even worse, if there was a speck of dust in there that was on the mirror and the laser hit it, it would have blown up the mirror or at least damaged it beyond repair. So that's why they had to make the vacuum. And I also saw that they didn't have the real mirrors at the time, but they're giant. They were like almost 90 pounds and they're hung by these little, little uh, fibers. Amazing place. And, you know, it worked. And if you tune in, if I'm sure most of you who are watching this have seen, have listened to the podcast, this will give you some nice background to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you found this footage. The other thing I found was that, um, you know, Kip in his talk to you describes how he uh, persuaded, not persuaded, but told Christopher Nolan, the director of the film Interstellar, for which Kip was the uh, science advisor and actually executive producer, how he could get his astronauts to travel through space really fast by using a wormhole. And he described how one of the astronauts in the film folds over two pieces of paper and puts a pencil through. I found the clip uh, in Inter from the film Interstellar where this happens, so enjoy it. He's going to show you how a wormhole works, and then for a frantic few seconds, we're going to go through the wormhole. Okay, so hold on to your seats. That, that, that's it. That's the wormhole. You say it don't spray here, huh? It's a sphere. Well, of course it is what you, you thought it would just be a hole. No, it's just that all the illustrations I've ever seen, they, the illustrations, I'll show you how it works. So they say you want to go from here to there, but it's too far, right? Mm -hmm. So a wormhole bends space like this, so you can take a shortcut through a higher dimension. Okay, so to show that, they've turned three-dimensional space into two dimensions, which turns a wormhole into two dimensions. A circle. What's a circle in three dimensions? Sphere. Exactly. A spherical hole. Everybody ready to say goodbye to our solar system? To our galaxy. Here we go. Okay, and we're out the other side. Who knows where we arrived? I guess in the film you find out I didn't go that far in, in, in my circle. You and I are now, you and I are back in a year in our relationship now, having gone through that work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. We can redo some of the ones that didn't turn out so well. Not that there were any, of course. 